Good day, and welcome again to In the Beginning, Part 2. Um, we were talking about the Big Bang, or rather the Big Dud, as I like to call it. Um, and I already gave you some evidence against this dumb theory, or dumb religion, actually. In Part 2, we will literally just carry on and give you even more evidence against evolution. Right. Hope you are strapped in. Here we go. So to recap, the Big Bang Theory, in a nutshell, says that a one-dimensional dot full of nothing and from nowhere spun very fast until it exploded. When this nothing exploded from nowhere came everything, all the galaxies and stars we see today. Now just to be clear on some timelines of the two worldviews, the creationist timeline is very simple. About 6,000 years ago, creation happened, 4,000 BC. At around 4,400 years ago, the flood happened. And then Jesus was born. And then 2,000 years later, here we are. So the evolutionist timeline, about 13.8 billion years ago, the Big Bang. Then the Earth formed around 4.6 billion years ago. Life appeared around 3 billion years ago. And around 3 million years BC, man evolved. So, now the evolutionist would ask me, where did God come from? Well, I believe God is forever. This means He always has been there and will always be there. But for all intents and purposes, let's say, I don't know. But if I ask you, Mr. Evolutionist, where did all the dirt, that's matter, come from? And you will have to say that you don't know either. So the creationists believe in the beginning God. The evolutionists believe in the beginning dirt. <laughs> don't tell me evolution is a science. It's a religion. But you will find that the media and textbooks always make it out to be a fight against between science and evolution, or science and religion. While evolution is not science to begin with. Now watch my first video on this channel where they are trying to get evolution taught in our schools here in South Africa. How they blatantly plan to omit words from the curriculum to be taught in the attempt not to make students aware that they are being lied to. Both creation and evolution are religions, yes. The difference is that my religion is not tax supported. Think about that. If you pay tax, you support the evolution fairy tale. See, if nothing exploded from nowhere, where did matter come from? Where did the laws come from? Gravity, centrifugal force, inertia, etc. Where did the energy come from? Another question, have you ever seen or played on a merry-go-round? <laughs> Let me explain. Dr. Hovind explains it the best. I'm using his slides here again. Suppose you ask some American football players, and yes, I know I can use the Springboks here since they won the World Cup, but these are the slides I have, okay? So, ask these football players to push some kids on a merry-go-round. At first, the kids would obviously be very happy. There will come a time when phase one kicks in. This is when the kids ask the football players to spin them faster. When they reach around 60 kilometers per hour, phase two kicks in. This is when the kids are all silent and just concentrate on hanging on. At around 90 kilometers per hour, we will call phase three, the kids are suddenly noisy again as they scream for footballers to stop they don't. Sorry. The football players only leave at phase 4. This is when at around 120 km per hour the kids start flying off in all directions. Phase 4 is important as you will make a scientific discovery by observing what is actually happening. If the merry-go-round was spinning in a clockwise direction, the kids who were on it moments ago but are now airborne will also be spinning clockwise. 
That is, of course, until they meet resistance of some sort or friction to stop them. <laughs> the reason they all spin in the same direction as the merry-go-round is because of the law of physics called conservation of angular momentum. This law is another piece of proof against evolution religion. You see, when a spinning object breaks apart in a frictionless environment, the fragments will always spin the same way. That is because the outside of the object is moving faster than the inside. The fragments will also not collide with each other. Throw a grenade after explosion, the longer you wait, the further the parts will get apart from each other. The fragments will be apart from each other. Now, Dr. H. Reeves, in The Origin of the Solar System, wrote, This, talking about angular momentum, would have caused the sun to spin very rapidly. Actually, our sun spins very slowly, while the planets move very rapidly around the sun. Hmm. In fact, although the sun has over 99% of the mass of the solar system, it has only 2% of the angular momentum. This pattern is directly opposite to the pattern predicted in the nebula hypothesis. Dr. Stuart Ross Taylor wrote, The ultimate origin of the solar system angular momentum remains obscure. Frank D. Stacy wrote, one of the detailed problems is then to explain how the sun itself acquires nearly 99.9% .9 of the mass of the solar system but only 2% of its angular momentum. These are all hardened evolutionists who cannot account for their own foolishness. They all understand the actual laws of physics but still accept, no, embrace the religion of evolution. So here is a question for my evolutionist friends. If the Big Bang really happened, you know, a swirling dot that exploded, shouldn't everything in the universe be spinning the same way? The answer must be yes, due to conservation of angular momentum. So why are these two, why are there at least two or three planets spinning the wrong way? Why are eight of the 99 moons in our solar system spinning backwards? Why does four planets have moons going both directions at the same time? Why are there galaxies that spin in the opposite direction? Here is CNN.com. It says goofy galaxy spins in wrong direction. Now I know that although you evolutionists may not have answers to all these questions, you might like to ask me the same questions as well. So Mr. Creationist, why are certain things in the universe spinning the wrong direction? I can answer it very simply. See, I believe that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. I believe he made it in such a way just to make the Big Bang Theory look stupid. I also believe in the, uh, in the Big Bang, but mine is a little different than the atheistic view. See, the Bible teaches the Big Bang, only it did not happen yet, but it will. In 2 Peter 3 verse 10 it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. So, as a Christian, if someone asks you if you believe in the Big Bang, you can say, yes, I do. That is why you have to get ready, make your life right with God, because the Big Bang is coming soon to a city near you. Now, um, by the way, if the Big Bang theory were true, the matter would be evenly distributed. Instead, it is lumpy. There are clusters of stars and then there are big great voids in between. Um, that's why they have to come up with things like antimatter and dark energy, etc. Because they need to explain where all the matter went. Even Sir Fred Hoyle wrote, 
I have little hesitation in saying that a sickly pall now hangs over the Big Bang Theory. Yes, I would say it does. Again, thanks Dr. Owen for a couple of slides here. Um, these, uh, 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 the second law of thermodynamics, it's another law of physics, saying everything tends towards disorder. Now, thermo means heat and dynamics means power. So, we're talking about the power of heat. You can't just create things from nothing. And whenever there is an exchange of energy, there is something lost. You can see its effects all around you. With time, everything starts falling apart. Unless you repair it, it will continue to decay. Ever notice how everything starts out new and fresh and how by, with time it becomes old and run down? That's the second law of thermodynamics hard at work. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens and the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old and doth a garment, as doth a garment. That's in Hebrews. Um, nothing gets better over time, as the evolutionist believes. As an example, ladies, take a look at your hair doing the morning. <laughs> Everything turns towards chaos. Yes, Sue at 20. Yes, Sue at 90 years old. <laughs> yes, she's again at 3,000 years old. Yet they want you to believe everything gets better with time. This textbook shows how bacteria evolved into us over 4 billion years. Was your ancestor a bacteria? Now the evolutionist will claim that you just need, a, need to add energy to the system to overcome the second law of thermodynamics. They will say, see, the sun adds energy to the earth and that's how evolution works. But it's not true. It's a deceitful argument. First of all, the universe is a closed system. Secondly, adding energy is destructive. Without a complex mechanism to harness the energy, you get nothing. The Japanese added a lot of energy to Pearl Harbor in the Second World War and it did not organize anything. The Americans retaliated and added a lot of energy to Japan. That did not organize anything. Um, ever seen tiles on the roof of your house after 10 to 20 years? It starts bleaching, it cracks, it goes downhill. The sun's energy will destroy your roof. It'll destroy your house. It'll damage your car's paint job. There's only one thing that can use the sun's energy. Chlorophyll. The only complex system good enough to harness the sun's energy is in a molecule called chlorophyll. Incidentally, this molecule is more complex than a modern space shuttle. If you want to believe it all evolved, molecule included, it all evolved by itself to become as complex as it is, you just go right ahead, but don't call it science. See, evolution theory violates the second law and is wrong. I told you I'll have proof for you that evolution never happened. This textbook says that this starfish are nearly 3.4 billion years old. And that it is your great, 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 great grandfather. <laughs> On the cover of this Discovery magazine of November 2004, it says, Was your ancestor a sea sponge? On page 64, it reads, um, when microbiologist Mitchell Sogan decided to trace human evolution to its roots, he had no idea he might find sponges. Great grandfather? SpongeBob? <laughs> sea stars and sea sponges, our ancestor. But wait, there's more. Out of the Anota Teacher edition of General Science comes this information. 
Monkeys and apes evolved into humans and modern apes. Grandfather? Hmm. You see, whenever you see billions of years ago, it is the same as long ago and far away. It usually means there's a fairy tale coming. According to the online version of the South African Journal of Education, while discussing forms of disruptive behavior and why they occur in pupils, it says, according to Raymond and the vet, more serious disruptive behavior such as conflict degenerating into physical violence is by far the most challenging misbehavior to deal with. It is often a subset of revenge seeking and one in five boys will resort to violent physical conflict. Fighting is reputed amongst learners to be the best way of resolving their conflict situations. According to Raymond, male learners regard peers who do not fight as weaklings. Where else do we find this behavior? Yes, in nature. Survival of the fittest. Evolution. As part of its study, it says, according to one respondent, learners from the same race gang up. They let the other learners know that, they, that only learners from the same race are allowed to join the gang, and those learners from the other cultural groups are not welcome and should stay away. You see, if evolution is true, then there is no, then there are races and that they are different, and so this behavior is normal. But now the study includes that one sorry, the study concludes that one of these reasons for the misbehavior is because of lack of discipline at home. It says possible reasons for disrespect, according to the respondents, can be can definitely be traced back to the home environment. Lack of ethical role models, lack of respect for parents, and lack of discipline at home being the main reasons for disrespect towards teachers. Now hold on a second. First of all, in South Africa, there's a law against corporal punishment. Children may call helplines and may be taken away from their parents if it is found that the parent gave them a hiding. Secondly, if the school is going to teach evolution, which means the kids are just animals, aren't they going to behave like animals? The public school system in South Africa wants to force teach our children everything from sex to evolution. And then they have the audacity to turn around and say that the misbehavior is the parents' fault. I don't think so. You are an animal and share common heritage with earthworms, according to this, man, according to this textbook. So Johnny, you are just an animal. Huh? Okay, <laughs> we teach kids that they are animals, so let's see the effect. Ever notice our music today are full of sex, destruction, death and blood? Kids are being taught that there are no absolutes. Almost all evolutionists believe this. So Mr. Evolutionist, you say there are no absolutes. Are you absolutely sure? Of course there are absolutes. Thus saith the Lord. This phrase appears around 413 times in the Bible. Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. I just want to tell any teacher who stands up in front of a classroom and teaches this dangerous religion, you are destroying the children's faith in God. And Jesus said, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believeth in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged up around his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Now it may be true that more scientists than not believe in evolution, but this still does not mean that it is true. In the US, according to Washington Times, 55% of U.S. natural scientists believe in Darwinian, Darwinian evolution. Not necessarily true, guys. In the past, scientists believed that everything revolved around the Earth, including the Sun. They were wrong. 
For 2,000 years it was taught that heavy objects fall faster than light ones. Galileo proved all objects fall the same speed. They believed in bloodletting as a cure for almost all diseases and illnesses. They called it humors. Did you know that this was usually done at the barber? Which is why this red and white sign still advertises barber shops today. In, 19, sorry, in 1799, George Washington was bled twice by his doctors before he died. They believed in the doctrine of humors. If only they read the Bible which says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. But how do you determine age of things? If you go diving and find a shipwreck with, same, with some old coins there, and you ask, and I ask you, when did the boat sink? You may say, I don't know. Well, let's assume that the coins have dates on them. You take the youngest coin, in this case, 1750, and can then safely say that the boat sank after 1750. Logical, isn't it? The youngest coin that you found is called the limiting factor for the age. The boat could not have sank before the date of the youngest coin. Similarly, there are many ways to limit the age of the earth. For instance, let's look at this. Now, if you find a bone in the dirt, it is not automatically stamped with the time of death and where it came from. Made by a dinosaur, 17 million BC in Taiwan. <laughs> so how can you tell the age of a fossil? In fact, how can you tell the age of the earth? In my opinion, the only way to tell how old something is, is to ask the guy who made it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. This is one of the verses, Colossians 1, in the Bible that proves that Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. For by Him, they were talking about Jesus. For by Him, which is Jesus, were all things created that are heaven, or that are in heaven, and that are in the earth. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning, Jesus was at the beginning, made them male and female? Same in Mark. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. By the way, it was Adam and Eve, okay? Not Adam and Steve. <laughs> now, if Jesus says it was the beginning, then we can figure out the age of the earth. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Notice, death entered by sin. Who was the first sinner? Adam. Okay. Same in this verse, in 1 Corinthians. For since by man came death, for as in Adam all die. Here's a few more verses which says that in these verses, or, or, or you can see that in these verses, uh, the whole earth, animals, plants, everything was affected by the sin of Adam. But if evolution is true, then Adam came into the world by death. Let me explain. According to evolution, lots of animals and plants had to die for Adam or man to evolve. So, the evolutionist says in the beginning, death created man. Where we say man created sin and thereby death. So, Adam is the first man. According to this verse, it says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made in living soul. And the first woman was Eve, as she was the mother of all things, all living. That's Genesis 3 verse 20. Adam was 130 when Seth was born, according to this verse. right? Seth was 105 when Enos was born. And Enos was 90 when Canaan was born. And so you can continue and carry on. You can eventually plot a chart, okay? And see 
there was approximately a thousand six hundred years from the beginning up to the flood. I would say the beginning was around 4,004, 4, but I won't go as far as to say October the 23rd or whatever the case may be. But that should roughly be it, um, and BC, before Christ. Now, BC stands for before Christ, by the way. Um, don't know if you noticed how they take it out of the dating lately. If you look at modern uh, uh, documentaries and things like that, textbooks even, it says BCE. BCE is, stands for Before the Common Era. They're effectively taking Christ out of it. So there's a big problem, guys. When Jesus said, Have ye, have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? question was Jesus lying did he not understand modern science or was he right so to summarize God made the world he owns it he makes the rules we are guilty all of us guilty of breaking God's rules We all broke the rules, guys, and should be punished. The rules are there, clear for all to see in ten, the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. We all broke them. None of you can say you've never lied. None of you can say you've never stolen. None of you can even say that you've never killed. Because if you even do it in your mind, you've done it. You've sinned. So we are all lying, thieving murderers. And should be punished. Ezekiel says, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But God loves us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. He loves us and He wants us to have eternal life. We will be punished or we must find a substitute to take our place. Jesus is the only one willing and able to stand judged in our place. In closing, I would like to show you a short extract from Dr. Hoven's videos. Please remember to like, leave a comment and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And I hope to see you next week. Thank you. If you died today, where would you go? I tell people, you really ought to think about that because you're going to be dead for a long time. George Washington died 205 years ago. And he is still dead. How much longer does he have to go? I don't care how long you live. You're going to be dead longer than that. Think about it. Think about it. You could die tonight. Have you seen the way they drive in Southern California? You got some rednecks moved out here, folks. I'm telling you what. You can get killed this evening. I'm going to die someday. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make it the last thing I do, but it's going to happen. Okay? It's going to happen to you, too. Now, all you get in this life is a little bitty dash between two dates. That's it. Someday there's going to be a rock with your name on it. You know I'm telling you the truth. What are you doing with your dash? A little boy came to Jesus one day. He said, Jesus, you look like you're hungry. You've been preaching all day. Here, Jesus, you can have my sack lunch. I don't have much. I only got five biscuits and two fish sticks, but you can have it. Jesus said, son, you mean I can have your whole lunch? He said, yeah, Jesus, go ahead. He said, well, son, have a seat right there. Watch this. 5,000 men, plus women, plus children, probably at least 20,000 people. Jesus said, okay, everybody sit down. They all sat down. He reached in that little boy's sack lunch, started making fish sandwiches, and passed them all out. Fed everybody in the crowd, including that little boy. That's interesting. 
When they got done, they picked up 12 baskets full of leftovers and sent them home with that little boy. Here, son, take this home to mama. Now, that little boy could have kept his lunch and fed himself. He decided to give it away, and he fed himself. And 20,000 more people, and got his name in the Bible. Not his name, but story. Now, I don't know what you're going to do with your life. You can do whatever you please with your life. I don't, I don't know what you're going to do. I'm leaving tomorrow morning. But listen, I would recommend you take your little life and say, Jesus, would you do something with this? Would you just do something? See, this is America, folks. You can work hard and make a lot of money and buy yourself a nice house, nice car, nice boat, have vacations. You really can live it up in this country. You really can. You can live your life for yourself if you want. That is your choice. Or you can live your life for the Lord, and then He will take care of what you need. It's amazing. I don't know what, what motivates you folks around here. I don't know. I don't, you just met me tonight. I just met you. But let me tell you what motivates me. 35 years ago, last week, I gave my heart to the Lord and got saved. I was a 16-year-old kid in high school, East Peoria, Illinois. I'd been saved for a couple of months. I was reading my Bible, going to church, growing, you know. And it was an independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical, chicken-eating Baptist church I was going to. They had, they had the, pul the preacher actually banged on the pulpit. I had never seen that before. I was raised in the Methodist church. We had two pulpits. One pulpit where they read the Bible from and another pulpit where he preached from. It took me a long time to figure out why. But it's because what he's reading over here is so far from what he's saying over here. <laughs> had to separate them, you know. And I was growing in the Lord, reading my Bible, going to church, you know, and thinking, this is great, you know. And then one day a friend of mine said, hey, Kent, do you want to go with me to the Heart of Illinois Fair? I said, what's going on? He said, we got a booth set up for campus life, and we're witnessing to folks. I said, you're what? We're witnessing. We'll tell them about how to get saved. I said, I've never told anybody how to get saved. I don't know how to do it. He said, well, come on. I'll just show up. I'll just give you one of the easy jobs. I said, okay. They had a couple of Volkswagen seats up there on the stage with wires in them. And people would sit down and they'd hit the button. And if you hit the button after the light turned green, you shock the other guy. But if you hit it too soon, you shock yourself. You know, bam, ooh, ah. And they're having contests who can shock the other guy, you know. And they use that to draw a crowd in there. Pretty cool idea. Anyway. Our job was to go out into the crowd and get them to fill out a questionnaire, just 10 simple questions. The last question said, would you like to get to know God better? And if they said yes, we were supposed to bring them to the back of the tent and introduce them to one of the people in the back of the tent who would lead them to Jesus Christ, a soul winner. I was having fun, man. First two days, I'm out there bringing people back. Hey, you want to get to know God better? Sure, come with me. Bring them to the back, open up the tent flap. George, this is Herman. He wants to get to know God better. Well, Herman, come on in, and I'd go back and get me another one. It was fun. Third night, Heart of Illinois Fair. Noise every place, kids on the stage getting, you know, shocked and everything. I went out, big old football player there from Richwoods High School. I said, hey, would you fill out a questionnaire for me? He said, sure. He wrote the, you know, answered the questions, last one. I said, would you like to get to know God better? He said, yes, I would. I said, all right, come with me. I'd done it before, nothing to it, you know. We walked back to the back of the tent, opened up the tent flap. There was nobody there. He said, what do we do now? I said, well, uh, I guess I'll show you. Keep in mind now, I'd never led anybody to the Lord in my life. This guy's twice my size. We went down, sat in the chairs, and, and the old metal chairs in the back of the tent in the heart of Illinois Fair. And I didn't know what to do, so I pulled a gospel track out of my pocket, God's Four Spiritual Laws. I said, let me read this to you. I sat there and read the whole thing. At the end, it says, would you like to receive Christ? He said, yes, I would. I thought, oh, brother, what do I do now? I got him on the hook, and I can't land him. <laughs> I said, well, it says pray this prayer. I said, let's close our eyes and bow our heads, and I'll pray first, and you repeat after me. He said, okay. I kept one eye open. I read the prayer off the track. I really did. <laughs> read the prayer. Lord, I'm a sinner. He said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to hell, you know, but I believe you died for me, and I want you to forgive me and save me right now. We got done. He looked at me and shook my hand. He said, Kent, thank you. I've been worried about this for two weeks. I said, you're welcome. And he walked out. 
I'm, noise every place. I mean, this is a carnival, you know. Here I'm standing in the, all by myself in the back of this tent. I thought, man, that was fun. Showing somebody how to go to heaven. I got down on my knees in the dirt next to that metal chair and I said, Lord, uh, it's me, it's Kent, I'm a brand new Christian and Lord, this is all confusing to me. I'll just tell you right now, I'm confused about a lot of things. I said, Lord, I don't know what you want me to do uh, with my life, I don't know. I said, but Lord, if it's okay with you, I, I think I'd like to do this the rest of my life. <laughs> I would just like to introduce people to you for the rest of my life. Well, it's been, uh, it's been 35 years. Nothing's changed. <laughs> I don't know what's important to you. Now, kids, you've got a thousand distractions in this world, I understand. I decided 35 years ago, I'm going to give my dash to Jesus. See what, see what he can do with it. Some of you can give it to making money. You can give it to, you, you can give your dash to all sorts of things. I don't know what you're going to do with your life. That's a decision you've got to make. I'd recommend you do what I did, though. And it's never too late. You can be 85 years old and still give your dash to Jesus. And you say, Lord, I don't have much left, but you can have this. He can still feed 5,000 people. It's just a crumb. If all you got is a crumb left, he'll take it. If you're a Christian here tonight, what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? There's a war going on. Can't you find something to do? If you're not going to shoot, carry bullets. Take care of the wounded. Do something, okay? Everybody ought to start a ministry. The worst of you could serve as bad examples, if nothing else. <laughs> Find something to do with your life.